Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Understories Writing Webinar. Uh, we call it a webinar. It's more of a meeting. We wanted to see your faces and to be able to talk to you. And my name is Amanda, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm one of the editors for the Understory, 350 Seattle's revamped blog space, which probably many of you have seen, given that you're here. Um, and we're here tonight to connect with one another and to learn more about the types of stories that we're hoping to publish to this blog and to review some of the writing concepts and tips that we think might be helpful for shaping a story to contribute to the blog. Um, so within that, we'll be able to have some conversations with each other, a little bit of writing time and brainstorming time. And um, yeah, open to feedback, comments at any stage of this. And um, before we truly dive in, I do want to acknowledge that though we are dispersed throughout the city and the region and maybe even the country, we are each of us individually on stolen land. Uh, I am in Seattle. I am living on the land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people. And um, if you know the original occupants of the land where you're sitting, you can consider them now. Feel free to share in the chat who they are. And um, in recognizing the indigenous people who lived here for many generations and live here still, I think that can offer us a way to see our actions and our conversations and what we learn through that lens. And so in the context of storytelling, I think it's important to consider whose stories are uplifted, whose stories are silenced. Um, this can guide us as we choose what to listen to and what to read and who to interview and what to write. Um, so just wanna ground us in that consideration. And that said, um, let's get to know one another. I think there are a good enough number of us that we can, and Emily and Annie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we can all introduce each other in this space rather than breakout rooms. Yeah. Um, of course, you can pass if you want, but beginning with the editors and then moving on to all of us, you can share your name and your pronouns. And the last story you encountered um, in the news, social media, magazine, or the like that changed your mind about something or shaped the way you are in the world. Um, this can be in small ways or big ways. Um, and so I'll... I'll begin with the, the other editors, and then I think the easiest way to do this will be for me to call on each person. Um, so, Emily, uh, would you be willing to start? Totally. Uh, my name is Emily Johnston. Uh, I'm the Communications Director for 350 Seattle. Uh, and I think the last thing that I read that really impacted me strongly was uh, a book whose title uh, resonates in the title of this blog. Uh, that book is The Overstory. Um, and I definitely recommend it to anybody who has not read it. Um, I also just want to add on to what Amanda said, uh, that we should try to keep our um, uh, introductions really brief, um, but I forgot I use she, her pronouns. Sure. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. And Annie. Hi, my name is Annie Dwyer, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm also one of the editors of the Understory blog. And um, although I knew about this question, I didn't think about answering it um, <laughs> until now. So the, I, I'll be honest, the first thing that pops to mind is I heard recently, I think I was listening to NPR, and um, there's a new law in Germany that requires people to walk their dogs twice a day, which has actually made me think a lot about pets <laughs> and what is their do. Thank you, Annie. Um, Linnea. Hi, everyone. My name is Linnea. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, story or book that has really impacted me lately um, is called See No Stranger, um, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love by Valerie Kaur, who's one of my heroes. Um, just a beautiful intertwining of her own story with the many issues that we're facing today. So highly recommend it to folks. Wonderful. You should drop that into the chat. Um, Bobby. Be Bobby, sure to you're unmute. There I am. 
I unmuted you, I think. Nope. You have to unmute yourself. It should be on the bottom left. Okay. I'm Bobby. Uh, she, her. I also live in Seattle on Duwamish land. Um, the last book I read all the time, I'm reading uh, Cast now by, uh, what is her name? Wilkerson, Isabel Wilkerson. But I, I'm reading this teeny book by Zadie Smith. And it's short essays. It's called Intimations. And it's quite wonderful the way she says things. And uh, it resonated with me when she talked about what do we do while we are quarantined. So I, I recommend it. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Up next, Kevin. Oh, hello. Um, my name is Kevin. And I guess one thing I've read recently is Snowden's biography. Um, I read that in a whole one sitting. I stayed up to like 5.30 a.m., but it's really, really changed my perception of surveillance and privacy. Hey, Kevin, whose biography did you say? Uh, Edward Snowden. Oh, Snowden, okay. Oh. Ah. I can link it in the chat. Got it. I love the feeling of staying up all night reading. <laughs> Okay, so um, I have Chris. I don't know you well. I think people call you something else, but um. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, people call me Kanit, okay. uh, which is fine. Uh, so I'm Kanit Cuttrell, she, her pronouns. I'm real excited about this, the whole blog and this webinar. The book I'm currently reading is that's having an impact is The Future We Choose. It's by Christiana Fugueres and Tom Rivet Karnak. They were the, the leads of the Paris Climate, Climate Agreement. And um, it's full of uh, hope and also what will happen if we don't hope and act on that hope. And it gives some good concrete steps of how we can get to where we need to be. It was just put out in 2020. So um, hmm. it's really good. I appreciate it. Thanks. Oh, and I live in West Seattle. Oh. So I'm on Duwamish land as well. And those who live on Duwamish land can pay real rent to the Duwamish tribe. That's a great point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if someone would be willing to drop the real rent link in the chat, that would be awesome. Up next, I have Trisha. One, um, my name is Trisha. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'm currently reading this book called Winners Take All by Anand Haradas. I might have pronounced that incorrectly. Um, and I think it's really interesting because it talks a lot about how um, the elites of the world that are claiming to do a lot of good are thinking that we create change through business and a lot of ways that don't hold elite accountable um, and how a lot of this... Um, mindset is kind of taking away from a lot of activism and like actual democratic changes. Um, so as an engineer myself, I think it's really interesting to read this because growing up, I guess like, and being an engineer, you're told a lot of these things of like, you can create, innovate change and a lot of this stuff. So I think this book's really eye opening in thinking about like what change really is and um, like thinking about like systemic problems. So really like this book so far. Thank you. And Anna? Hi, I'm Anna. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And um, I was legitimately going to say see no stranger. Um, so I can retweet that. It's so good. Um, another book that was really formative for me is um, A Book of Hours by Raina Maria Rilke, translated by Joanna Macy, who um, lots of folks probably know from her work around The Great Turning. Thank you, Anna. Okay, up next, Alice. Um, I would say I also an engineer by training and that so uh, what Trisha said really resonated with me. Um, <laughs> I've had to sort of unlearn that piece over and over again. And um, I am going to skip what I was going to say for the prompt and um, heartily recommend um, for leisure reading Rilke's French poems, as long as we're talking about Rilke and she, her pronouns. Thank you, Alice. 
Jess. I actually just finally finished reading There, There by Tommy Orange. Mm. And I love it. And I kept not reading it because the plot didn't appeal to me. <laughs> but um, I read it and it's absolutely amazing and I recommend it to everybody. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, it's basically a story of identity within the Native American community um, and especially with uh, urban Indians and it's set specifically in Oakland. But it just covers so many heavy themes all within that. Um, so yeah, highly recommended. He's a brilliant writer. You know, I didn't need a longer uh, book. Sorry, uh, I used to she read her. <laughs> Sorry, oh, Sorry yeah. I forgot my pronouns. She, her, and I'm on Duwamish territory in Capitol Hill. Thank you, Jess. Oh, there, I was just there saying, is like, very good book. <laughs> just yeah. the forward is amazing, if, even if you don't get to the book. All right, three people recommending it. That's amazing. Um, okay, up next, Deborah. Mm -mm. You're muted, Deborah. <clears throat> uh, yes, I was saying, let me unmute myself. It took the time to get the cursor to go to the right spot. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I do use the pronoun she, her, and as an elder, it's really awkward to, for me to say that. It's like, what? What? But I understand um, modern times. I read constantly, both novels and uh, nonfiction, and I am reading an old book right now, Matthew Fox's Original Blessing, because I'm teaching about the tradition of blessing, which our culture has forgotten about, and it's totally um, enlightened me about the history of Christianity, and, and so that's been worthwhile. And another quick mention would be Charles Eisenstein's Climate, A New Story. Very uh, much motivated me to teach what I'm teaching now because it's part of the new story for our culture. So, and I live on Bainbridge Island and I am not positive all the different tribal names that would have been here, um, but I'm sure Duwamish and Salish are two of them. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks. And finally, we have Kathy. Kathy, are you there? She's muted. Maybe she have to wait for a minute. Yeah, we can uh, also, if maybe she stepped away and. That's okay, we can come back. Mm. Sound good? Um, okay, so thank you everybody for introducing yourselves, adding so many amazing recommendations to my list of books to read, which is long enough as is, and now longer, thankfully, I love that. Um, and we can get into talking about the understory. What is it? What are our ideas for what it could be? And Emily will share her thoughts with us. I just need to share my screen really quickly. <clears throat> and. Oh, and uh, if everybody, uh, unless you're speaking, please mute your computer so that the presenters can be heard. And is everybody able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, Emily. I, I am speaking for a moment. Emily, do you think you could share those slides out? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Uh, well, um, Alice, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean. Link to the slides in the sh chat, please. Oh, no, they're not online. Alice, I can email them to you as Emily's talking. That would be awesome, thank you. Okay, uh, and, and can you put us on the right one first? Cool, yep. thank you. All right, so um, we wanted to think about, oh, actually I can't see the whole one, so hang on just one second, there we go. Um, we wanted to think about uh, how to revive the blog, you know, which un until recently was like a lot of organizational blogs, and by that I mean it was kind of a mishmash of anything that somebody wanted to write or information that we thought was important to present, uh, you know, an explanation of something, um, 
so as a mishmash of things, there were often good individual pieces, but there wasn't a coherence that would make somebody say like, hey, I want to go and read the 350 Seattle blog, you know, and we also, frankly, just weren't keeping up with it enough. So it, people, we weren't posting often enough to make people have that instinct. Um, so when we considered relaunching it, we thought, okay, we've got to have something that draws people, you know, bo both by virtue of its very nature and also by virtue of our being consistent with trying to get sort of high quality stories out there. And this is a really important moment in time when climate storytelling couldn't possibly be more consequential, right? Uh, because people need to understand uh, how they can get engaged. They need to understand how powerful we can be as a movement. Um, and they need to understand the future that we are working towards uh, and have a vision of it so that, you know, uh, climate grief doesn't just completely overwhelm us every day, right? Along with, uh, you know, grief at, you know, um, the state of the world in terms of race or the economy or COVID-19. So, uh, yes, so those were some of the things that we were thinking. Um, and then specifically we thought, okay, what are our goals? Uh, what do we want to achieve? What are the social changes we're trying to advance? Um, and the list we came up with that we definitely will add to over time is we wanted to contribute to movement building and coalition building to demystifying social change and helping people see what's possible. Uh, I think those are all pretty clear. Um, and you know, you may have other thoughts that we will consider as well. Uh, and we're totally open to that. Then we thought, all right, well, who is our audience? You know, who are we trying to reach and persuade and who are we likely to reach and likely to be able to persuade? Um, so in that case, you know, we thought about a lot of folks sort of stumble onto the website because they see a quote about us or you know from one of us or something that we've been working on um they know the name 350 and they live in seattle so they are looking for a way to get involved but they don't know anything about us um, and then there are folks who do know something about us the people who who want to plug in but don't yet know how uh, there are people who are feeling a lot of climate despair um, and probably also don't know how to plug in uh, and maybe you know, aren't even certain that it's worthwhile. Uh, and, you know, stories can often reach people uh, in their grief in a way that, you know, simple instructions and even movement building don't. So that's an important category of people. Um, and then also simply people who don't know their power and potential, people who haven't studied up on social movements and how they work, and therefore just sort of see one protest and see another protest and don't really understand the way that it adds up over time or the way that it can come together into uh, what's called by some people the moment of the whirlwind where changes that have been building for a length of time you know suddenly begin to cohere often because of something that happens outside of our control in the in the world um you know i think there's a we could make a very good argument that we're in a moment of the whirlwind right now you know, between the uprisings and COVID-19, people understand the world and its weaknesses, the system, weaknesses of the system that we've built in a new way. And so they're open in a new way to change. Uh, and that's an invaluable moment and we have to make use of it as best we can. Um, then our constituency is a little different from our audience, uh, but who is our base? You know, and also not just our base in 350 Seattle, but who shares our values and goals and interests? Because uh, there are a lot of, you know, we have about 13,000 folks on our list and there are a lot of people uh, not on that list who we know do share our values, um, you know, uh, locally. So it's not only 350 folks and other climate activists, it's also people working in adjacent movements uh, and people most impacted by climate change. So, you know, people understand, uh, you know, what's going on because they're living what's going on in some cases. You know, some folks in South Seattle, for example, may have seen the sea level rise maps and understand that the house they bought last year uh, is going to be underwater on a regular basis by the time they've finished paying off their mortgage. You know, and then of course there are people who face more, more immediate climate impacts too, or their families do, their families in other places. If you have families right now, family right now in Louisiana or Texas or in California, you are probably very worried about the climate impacts on your family. Um, so finally, 
the stakes. Uh, what is the work, why is the work, excuse me, of storytelling important? Um, I think probably everybody who's here is here because they understand that the work of storytelling is important. Um, but a few reasons why that we came up with are that stories inst inspire people, stories change minds, stories build community and culture, and stories are more fun than phone banking. Uh, additionally, like I said, they can help us see the future we're working towards, not just the problems that exist currently. Um, so all of those things are really important. I think, I can't remember who it was. Uh, I don't think, I think I heard Toni Tony Morrison quote this, but I don't think she, she, ori she originally said it. But anyway, the, the quote was, uh, you know, people will understand, will, will forget what you did they will forget what you said, but they will never forget the way that you make them, made them feel. Uh, and stories, you know, are, are, are often about making people feel something, maybe making people feel a fear or a hope that we feel, or, you know, uh, the, 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 a feeling related to a story that we're telling that somehow they connect to. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's a big list and by no means do we expect every story to, to hit all those notes and all those audiences and so forth, but those are some of the uh, things we're trying to achieve and the ways we think uh, it's important to achieve them. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I'll say for the moment. Annie? All right, so I'll jump in here. Um, our, our big purpose in running this workshop is to help you situate your own stories and the stories that you'd like to tell in relationship to those overarching goals, our audience, our constituency, the stakes. And a lot of times uh, when people start thinking about, oh, what could I, what could I write about? What could I tell? It's, it's tempting and it's actually important on some level to, to really think big um, and to, and to, you know, want to talk about climate change um, and you want to say everything there is to say about climate change or climate justice. Um, and, um, and so our goal today will be, or this evening will be to help you kind of narrow that, that focus um, and become more effective in, in what you have to say. So the concept metaphor that you probably did not expect to see in the workshop um, about the understory blog is the seven day layer or seven layer cake versus the day old pizza with hot dog crust. And so what we're going for when we're developing a topic is that narrow slice that is rich and deep. Um, the seven layer cake is, is the goal. And what we wanna move you away from is the day old pizza, not only pizza, but with hot dog crust to boot. Um, so that is, that is the, you know, the encapsulation, our encapsulation of the attempt to say as much as possible, to cover as much, as much ground as possible, and ultimately to come up with a, a really weird dish. Um, so that's our job as editors. And that's the, that's the work of this, of this workshop is to, um, is to develop that seven layer cake. And we know that each of you have them. So um, Amanda, if you could switch us along to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so here are just a couple of examples of topics. And in fact, uh, I think one of the things that we've found to be useful is to, to move away even from um, an incipient argument or a topic and to think about what you want to write about in terms of questions. And I think specifically how questions can be really, really, uh, really, really useful because they open up lines of inquiry and forms of discovery that you might not have even anticipated and that can make for really, really fresh writing. So um, here are a couple of examples of moving away from a really, really broad um, pizza-like topic to a deep, um, narrow slice of seven layer cake. Um, so instead of thinking about climate change, um, uh, you know, a, a potential topic or a, a line of inquiry might be, how might a, a young person in the 21st century see their future differently than their parents or grandparents because of climate change? Um, so you can see somebody maybe in their 20s um, or teens writing about that. Um, instead of thinking about activism or climate justice, you might formulate a, a question that is something like, how are the concerns of climate justice and indigenous people's movements united through fossil fuel divestment campaigns? And I think that's a question that is actually answered or explored through one of our existing blog posts. And then, um, you know, instead of everything you've ever thought about climate change or activism or anything else sort of justice related, um, you know, Amanda's 
uh, blog post from last week is, is a great example of something that uh, takes a more narrow slice and explores the question of how my struggle with addiction led me to activism. And I think the, the questions that she asks, asks are actually more um, nuanced and numerous than this, but it's, it's a good start. So, um, so think about that. Think about moving away from the, the pizza to the cake, um, moving away from the broad topic to the how question. And, um, and if you're stuck, we'll, we'll, we'll spend the rest of the workshop working on this. But um, another kind of word of advice might be to kind of think about different subgenres too within, within the blog post genre. Um, so the next slide, I think articulates a few of them. Um, if you're, you know, if you're wanting to write for us, but don't feel like you, you know, you have a, an idea off the top of your head, you could always do an interview. Um, that is a, re a really, really useful thing. Um, there are, are tons of folks with tons of wisdom. Um, and then we'd love to, you know, we'd love to excavate that and, and showcase that in the blog. Um, so that's one thing that you can do and we can always help you develop questions for an interview. Another kind of subgenre that you might pursue is the book review. It sounds like from our introductions that we have a lot of readers. Um, so if there's a book you're reading that is somehow speaking to climate justice, climate change, um, that's a not, that's another option, particularly if it's a recently published book, um, and then and then finally there's the, there's always the hot take, right? Like what's in the news, um, you know, whether nationally or locally or regionally, um, you know, sometimes just observing and thinking carefully about what's going around what what's going on around you can um, lead to some some insights that that speak to the bigger picture. So. Um, that's a that's a start, but we're gonna we're gonna uh, really try to hash this out and enter into a kind of activity phase of our workshop to do that. So um, basically, what we'll do is we'll give you five minutes to do some free writing, and um, however you know whatever is most useful to you, you could sketch this out on a notepad. Uh, maybe you know maybe you're a computer worker if you want to just copy and paste the well you probably can't do that maybe you can because the slides are already posted um, you know if you want to create some kind of table um, if you want to just you know jot down some notes but um, we'll give you five minutes to to really begin to formulate some ideas about these four areas so um, first and you don't have to you don't have to you know have the perfect idea you could jot down a couple of ideas um, this is really just brainstorming time. Um, what is your angle on climate justice? The seven layers, you know, slice of cake that you're thinking of, or maybe two or three. Um, are there audiences beyond or within the audiences that, that we uh, indicated or that Emily spoke to in introducing the blog? Um, are there more specific audiences that you want to reach or even multiple audiences? Maybe there are competing audiences. Um, that might require you to write a little bit more carefully, but identifying those audiences will be really important in approaching, you know, whatever it is that you want to write about. Um, within the, you know, within the overarching goals of the understory, are there more specific goals that you have in writing? Maybe you want to advance a, you know, specific campaign. Uh, maybe you want to get people to think in a different way about something. And then try to articulate for yourself personally, as well as politically, um, maybe even intellectually, what is at stake in the story that you have to tell? Um, why is it important to you and to the, and to the larger movement? So we'll just give you five minutes to begin to, to jot down some ideas on, on these, um, uh, you know, uh, under the aegis of these different um, topics. And then um, we'll bring you back together. It looks like since it's 634, how about we say 640? And um, at 6.40, we'll put you into small groups and allow you to discuss and help each other formulate um, what, you, what you're thinking in terms of your, your own roots. Uh, are there any questions about that before we get started? All right, so um, feel free to either leave your screen on if you wanna stop your video, you're welcome to do that. But we'll just take a break here and uh, bring you back at 6.40.
And when you close the rooms, it'll give them 60 seconds anyway. So you can probably close them now. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay. Uh, breakout rooms, close all rooms. Do we have people share out what they talked about here or not, right? Not really. I'll just be like, hey, is it everything okay? I think cool. only the second one, second break. Okay, mm -hmm. sounds good. I mean, I'll ask her questions, but. Six, How eight. are we doing on time? Are we about on time? Don't know. I don't know either. All right. Nice to see you all back. How did that go? How did the activity go? The pre write go? Um, were there any questions that came up in your conversations? We won't have time to share out um, completely, but just if there are anything, you know, if there's anything burning right now that you'd like to ask, um, there's definitely an opportunity to do so. All right. Well, then we'll just keep on pushing on. Um, so hopefully that that gave you at least a sense of um, how you'd like to situate yourself vis-a-vis -vis the understory. Um, once you've actually identified, though, uh, what you would like to write about. Um, there's a way to even think a little bit more concretely about it. Um, and so we are borrowing um, a lot here from the Center for Story-Based Strategy, which is a national movement building organization. Um, there's a book called Reimagining Change, How to Use Story-Based Strategy to Win Campaigns. Um, it's now a second edition by Patrick Rainsborough and Doyle Canning. Maybe Emily or, or Amanda um, wanna post that in the chat just to give you the reference, but they have, um, in, their, in their work on story-based strategy, um, identified these elements of the battle of the story that we found to be really, really effective in thinking about how to tell a story. So um, we're just gonna go through the elements of a story um, and help you kind of concretize those elements in your own idea for a blog post. So um, if you wanna mm -hmm. push next, there we go. Um, so one of the main things um, in uh, main elements of a story is basically how you frame a story. Um, what's the problem? What's the problematic? What's the conflict? And um, crucially here, I think, is, is how is the framing of the conflict in, in your telling different from that of the dominant cultures? Um, and you can just go through all and uh, characters, um, basically, um, the the characters of a story um you know oftentimes it's yourself right um who though are the heroes in your story are there any villains are there um other characters who are you what are the you know what are the people in your story that you'd like to represent um and how do you characterize them um I think the concretization of your story is always gonna be really, really important. So um, this is the kind of like classic nonfiction writing advice of, of showing rather than telling. Um, are there particular anecdotes? Are there sensory details? Um, how do you sort of like paint a scene? How do you have that kind of ekphrastic moment in your, in your storytelling so that you can really draw people in and anchor your narrative? Um, particularly in, in climate justice work, I think there's oftentimes an an opportunity to gesture towards the future, right? Whether it's a kind of dystopian future of a world in which, um, you know, we do nothing about climate change or whether it's a, a kind of alternative futurity in which we learn how to mitigate and adapt and, um, and, and change the way in which we live. Um, challenges are another thing that you might want to consider. Um, in telling your story, is there a way in which you're running up against common sense assumptions, um, you know, dominant ideas about beliefs, practices, behaviors. Um, if so, you really want to draw those out. And then finally, um, 
oftentimes in telling a story, there's there's a kind of inherent call to action that might um, proceed from that story. So um, it might be, you know, direct political action, um, and it can also actually be a kind of call to thinking um, that that maybe is not necessarily um, instantiated in any given, you know, practice, but or action, but um, but might eventually lead there. Um, so I know this is kind of subsisting on a really abstract level, which is actually, um, you know, the opposite of, of what we're instructing you to do here. So um, we just wanted to give you a little bit more um, in the way of example in, in communicating these different elements of the story that you might want to draw out. So um, in looking at our, our first few blog posts on the understory, I think there are a couple of really good examples of this. And also in, in looking at some of the campaign work of 350 Seattle. So um, framing the conflict, if you look at Rachel Heaton's interview, Uh oh. Um, of, you know, the the different framing of climate change, even for, for people who are sort of like friendly to climate justice movements. Um, Annie? You, yeah? Uh, you cut out for just a moment. So I'm wondering if you could repeat the last sentence that you said about framing the conflict. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so so Rachel's piece, Ra Rachel's interview does a, I think a really good job, even for people who, um, you know, really care about climate change or want to become involved in climate justice movements. Maybe they haven't necessarily thought about the relationship between that and indigenous people's movements. And, and so she does a, a kind of different framing of the issue. Uh, Emily's piece is, is really useful in illustrating kind of a really good characterization. It's a kind of tribute to Imogene Williams who recently passed away this past spring. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful portraiture of her um, drawing out specific words that she said um, while being arrested, for instance. Um, you know, even images like her unruly white hair. Um, and, and I think even if you're not necessarily focusing a piece on a person, um, in telling a story, you can draw out characters in that way. Um, concretizations. Amanda's, Amanda's blog post is, is a beautiful, has this beautiful moment at the beginning where she's talking about a cherry tree and a mulberry tree that she used to sit in as a little kid, right? Um, and then it becomes this kind of metaphor for um, that, you know, that introduces you to the rest of rest of the piece. So um, I think that's a, a wonderful instance of the really effective use of sensory detail. Um, in looking at, uh, you know, examples of possible futures, right? Or the, the invocation of possible futures, uh, we don't necessarily have a blog. I mean, I think all of the blog posts that we have so far do this in some way, but um, you can even think about specific campaigns like the Seattle for a Green New Deal campaign, which, you know, stipulates like, oh, we want to do these specific things like create, um, create more affordable housing, create, um, you know, new green jobs, um, really, you know, think about weatherizing homes to make them more energy energy efficient and through all of these different actions, um, you know, creating a, a more healthy, beautiful city for everybody. Um, challenges. I think the the Rachel Heaton interview, again, is a really good example of this um, challenging this, this kind of like normalized practice that we have of um, how we invest, how we bank, right? And saying, oh, actually, um, this is problematic and we can do this differently and we can hold big banks accountable. Um, even though I think the common sense understanding is that, um, you know, the, the forces of capitalism are, are beyond the, you know, the everyday person. And then um, calls to action. I think the, um, you know, 350 Seattle has done a lot of work around Puget Sound Energy's fracked gas facility. Um, this has involved calls that range from standing with the Puyallup tribe to writing letters of opposition, signing petitions, submitting public comments, showing up at protests. You can, you know, you can connect whatever you're writing about to things like that. Um, and again, like I said earlier, you can also think about calls to thinking um, that, you know, might lead to these different kinds of actions. So those are just some examples. Um, if we can flip to the next slide. What we want to do now is now that you have your slice, right, um, now that hopefully you've identified at least a possible topic or two, um, some audience that you'd like to reach, um, goals that you have for writing, 
with that in mind, uh, we'd like you to take some time to elaborate like how you might frame a conflict, right? How you might draw out some different characters. Are there particular futures that you'd like to invoke or ways that you might um, show rather than, than tell the, the story that you have to, have to relay? Um, so what we'll do next is, is give you some time to, again, do some free writing on this. Uh, I think we'll give you 10 minutes to, to think about this. Um, 10 minutes to, I, I think I'm getting the timer on here. Emily and Amanda, can you help me out on this? Actually, um, I think 10 minutes works really well. And then after that, we will again, go into rooms for about 10 to 15 minutes to okay. share. Great, yes. So it's a think, share, and then, um, and then your, your, um, yeah, your, your task and, um, you know, after you, well, actually just for now, all you have to do is think, and then we'll give you some more specific directions when you go into your breakout rooms. Um, but just take the next 10 minutes. Let's see, what time is it right now? Seven. Seven, perfect. On the nose. So at 7.10, um, you'd prefer, but at 7.10, we'll bring everybody back and um, give you some more additional instructions um, about going into breakout rooms. Okay, everybody, it is 7.10, so go ahead and finish whatever thought or sentence you're in the middle of. And... Um, Great, looks like everybody is present. And so, uh, and we had a couple people leave. So now we will be going into breakout rooms. Um, there'll be three people each. And so, so far you've explored a topic. Um, you've fleshed it out a little by considering these different categories, um, futures and concretizations and these other things that help you um, give shape to whatever story it is that you're considering. So now we'll be sending in, you into these small breakout rooms so you can share again with each other what you, uh, maybe something you uncovered about your topic by considering these categories. Um, did anything emerge in terms of the story you want to tell by considering these things? And as you talk to one another, your assignment is to um, Take one example from your group discussion that illustrates one of these particularly well to report back to the larger group. So if somebody has, you know, like a really exciting call to action or a specific future they're envisioning that came to them during this free write, um, a, a compelling future, take note of that uh, as a group toward the end of your discussion and, and bring it back to the full group so you can share it with us. Um, you'll have, let's see, I think, 15 minutes to be in these groups. And so, um, Emily, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and send them off. They did this a little bit unevenly, so I am trying to even it out a bit. Great. Okay. Uh, and I'll copy the assignment too into the chat. All right. Oops. Okay, there we go. Hey everybody, welcome back. Let's see, I know a couple people dropped off. I think this is everybody. Um, great, how was that? I wanna hear from your group about, um, you know, an example that illustrates one of those categories well, or, you know, if something else came up or you want to share something, um, feel free to do that. What do you got?
Come on, somebody be brave. Uh, okay, I can go. I thought it was kind of interesting in our breakout um, breakout group. I, I talked about um, a quote by Naomi Klein that I think for me was really impactful and made me think about um, like guilt you feel about your inability to like reduce your climate foot like your carbon footprint to some extent based on your own circumstances and um, Alice really talked about like how um, Naomi Klein's book um, this um, climate or this changes everything I believe it is right um, really spoke to her and really changed her life and I think it was really cool how um, the same author kind of like influenced us both and got us thinking about like how words are so impactful and like the way like a certain author can say something can really like change your perspective in ways that maybe like if you had read a similar thing but it was phrased differently or in a different point in your life like maybe would you just like glance past it and just like moved on as if like it was just another day so I thought that was kind of interesting yeah it is thank you Trisha would anyone else be willing to share what you discussed in these groups You can also talk a little about the topic you're considering, if that feels more comfortable. Yeah, I think we're uh, a small enough group that, yeah, okay, go ahead. I was just to say, we discussed in our group, you know, that characters can be non-human. Um, so some of those were like time or trees or, um, you know, just nature in itself. I love that idea. Yeah, that's really good. Maybe one more person. Um, then again, if no one else wants to share, we can move on. But I'll invite one more person to share uh, what you talked about in your discussion groups about these categories. Okay. That's okay. Uh, I hope the discussion within the group was lively and felt interesting and um, yeah, unearthed some stuff or led to connections that you hadn't made before maybe. Um, and I think next is a brief break, just a little bit of a break from your screen, five minutes, uh, bio break if you need one, fill up on tea and water and meet back here, um, let's see, at about 7.33. And we will go ahead and do the last portion of our workshop. So feel free to do that now and see you in about five minutes. All right, we're at 7.33. I'll just wait a few seconds to make sure I can see people are back. Okay, we are entering our last portion of this workshop and um, let's see. I'm actually not the one who should be speaking right now. So I'm gonna share my screen for you, Annie, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, conventions of the genre, and then some nitty gritty kind of writing tips. And, uh, and that'll be the rest of the workshop. So let me share my screen. Thanks, Amanda. So uh, basically, we, we've already given you all a lot to think about, uh, not only your topic and your audience and your purpose for writing. And basically in doing that, um, basically what we specified was what your rhetorical situation is. Um, you know, your, 
for your writing. We've really tried to sketch out, you know, what the what the context is there. Um, a lot of times in uh, you know in, in talking about writing, genre can be a really helpful way to approach a different writing task um, because genres are ways of writing that have emerged to deal with rhetorical situations that appear again and again and again and basically conventions crystallize and you can identify and adopt those conventions rather than reinventing the wheel um, and so genre analysis can be a really really effective way to figure out how to write well within a new kind of genre um, if we could just move on to the next one um, so you know, and for the blog is just to take a look at other blogs, um, collect a bunch of examples and or as you read the understory, hopefully you'll read the understory, uh, you know, pay attention to the kind of the genres that emerge and the subgenres that that emerge within the understory. Um, think about things on a number of different levels. Uh, I think we can can do a genre analysis. Um, on the level of rhetorical appeals. So are there appeals to emotion? Are there appeals to one's credibility? Um, are there um, rational arguments being made? Um, and then you can, you know, you can think about things like um, what is the voice? Um, what is the tone or the mood? What would be discordant or dissonant in this, in this genre? Um, what do people tend to include? What do people tend to exclude? How are the blog posts organized? Um, how long are they? Those those kinds of things matter. Um, uh, you know, a, a blog post is a fairly short genre. Um, you might even like take a look at a couple of examples and and do a word count and and give your sen sen give yourself a sense of of the of the sort of breadth of the of the genre um, and and think about too like breaking apart different paragraphs of a couple of examples and and figuring out if there's a pattern to the organization. Um, and then just thinking about register, you know, are our sentences simple or complex? Um, you know, what is the, you know, what is the language used here um, pitch to this particular audience? Um, so again, it's, it's just really, we don't want to go, um, although I said we would go into the weeds, um, we're not going to go too much into the weeds, just paying attention to energy levels tonight. But, um, but genre analysis is a, is a really useful tool. So we at least wanted to alert your attention to it um, and you know, give you the opportunity to, to think about um, you know, looking at, at potentially writing for the blog as, as a matter of entering into a, a new genre um, and, and proceeding in that way. Um, so next slide. Great, um, so this is a lot to think about. Um, We've, um, we've talked a lot about the understory, its goals, then tried to get, you know, get you to think a little bit more about your own goals, your own topic, your own audience, um, allowed you to elaborate some of the elements of the story that you might pull out. Um, and I think the, the really important thing that we wanna um, underscore here is that these are all important exercises, I think, for orienting yourself to your writing, but it's not necessarily that you have to consciously hold them um, as you're writing any given piece. So, um, and not every piece will have a really, really strong set of characters and a really unique framing of a, of a conflict and, um, you know, all, all of the different elements of a story. Um, some of those might be more submerged, some of them might be more surfaced in any given example. So um, the point of all of these exercises tonight is, is really just to, to help you kind of um, sketch a framework for yourself, orient yourself to your work, and um, allow different elements. Sorry, there's a cat. That was a whisker that you saw. <laughs> I'm going to get, get him off the table. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's more about, um, you know, allowing things that that might emerge to um, you know to become more conscious and then just letting go of the rest um, and as you as you sit down to write really um, we want you to to try to at the same time as as holding this all in mind just let it go to um, we'll we'll be here to, to help you um, you know we see writing as a really collaborative process and um, the work of an editor is really helping you think through these different things so um, as much as you can, relax, write, um, be in touch with us, and, and really think about getting in touch with us before you even start writing, 
because we can, um, you know, we can really help you narrow narrow the the topic for your post, help you identify some some interesting questions to explore. Um, and if we, you know, if we hear your pitch, might be able to help you pull out some some really strong elements. So um, so do be in touch with us. Don't be shy. And um, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Amanda to um, who's who's going to talk a little bit more about some more um, micro level writing tips. Yes, thank you, Annie. Um, yeah, and I'm really gonna reiterate what Annie just said quite a few times that I'm gonna be going over some nitty gritty stuff with you um, to kind of close us out. But these are things you don't need to worry about too much. It's good to review them and have them in mind, um, but it's also partly what we're here for. And so um, this is the last portion. We're gonna get into the weeds just a little and uh, these will be the writing considerations that come after you do some of the brainstorming and categorizing and writing itself. They're often addressed during a copy edit, which is what I do for my day job. Um, truly the fine toothed comb of editing, the sort of final touch. Um, so not necessarily things you wanna worry about when you're in the flow of writing. And these are tips you may have heard quite a bit before. They can help take a piece of writing from good to great. And we're giving you them to empower you to use them. But again, identifying them is also part of what we're here for. And so uh, just a brief overview of these. The first one, of course, is uh, be wary of wordiness. And, you know, okay, so I've been a writer and an editor all my life, but when I get started writing, I just can't help myself. I get really hyperbolic. I feel, I fill my prose with a lot of language. Um, and that's kind of nice to be in. When I'm writing, I can just follow the flow of whatever's coming out without worrying about wordiness too much. But as you're preparing to submit your piece to us and receive feedback, maybe your final review, you can look for any words or phrases that aren't necessarily adding to your story or that might be stronger if they were put more concisely. Um, Emily brought up a great example yesterday, and I do this as well, which is using three adjectives in a row that all mean the same thing. So, you know, if you're talking about a bank and you wanna say the bank is awful, terrible, horrible, um, you can just choose one of those. I pulled these examples from the internet, so they're a little excessive. I'm not sure any of you would write this first sentence, but just as an example, a wordy way to say this is, imagine a mental picture of someone engaged in the intellectual activity of trying to learn what the rules are for how to play the game of chess. Um, a more concise way to put that, as you can see, is imagine someone trying to learn the rules of chess. You're approaching the same idea, you're getting the same thought across, and readers will feel um, the same way when they read it, but it's more concise and clear. If you think about, you know, how can I reword this to be a little more concise, a little more clear? This comes up to around um, determiners and modifiers. So saying any particular type of dessert is fine with me. A uh, more concise way of saying that is any dessert is fine with me instead of um, needing to rely on the particular type of, kind of a filler there. And the way I see this the most come up in the writing that I edit is with words like very and extremely. Um, these modifiers that are used, of course, to uh, show the level of which you might be feeling or experiencing something, but very is one that writers lean on a lot. And so you can consider when you see very or extremely or a word like it, whether another word might suffice. So very cold can become freezing. Very surprised can become alarmed. Um, and you know, if very cold doesn't exactly mean freezing, of course, contextually you can determine that. But often when I see the word very, I have a hunch that another word might more powerfully convey what the writer is trying to convey. And then keep an eye out for redundant pairs, like true facts. The word true is not necessary uh, because the definition of facts is that they are true. And same with past memories. Um, past is not necessary. And 
So these are just a few examples. And um, again, as you're kind of going through the flow of writing, they may pop up and that's okay. And I wouldn't even say some of these are wrong, but uh, it's a good thing to keep an eye out for. Uh, consider each sentence and whether it might be, whether it might benefit from being less wordy. Uh, next up is active voice and passive voice. I'm sure many of you have gone over this before in different writing scenarios or classes. Um, so just a quick review. In an active sentence, a subject acts upon its verb. So in the sentence, the girl threw the ball, it's clear that the girl is the subject. The action or verb is through, and the person doing it is the girl. The girl is the subject and clearly performing the action. But in the passive sentence, the subject does not perform the action of the verb. So in this sentence, uh, in a passive way, would be said, the ball was thrown by the girl. Um, I often hear to uh, the, the chicken crossing the road brought up a lot in this context. Uh, you wouldn't say the road was crossed by the chicken. You'd say the chicken crossed the road. And again, passive voice isn't always wrong. You can use it if you want to emphasize the action over the actor. Um, so you might say the policy was considered by city council if you're wanting to bring attention to the policy over who reviewed it. Um, but much of the time, sentences that use passive voice are wordier and a little less clear. Sometimes when you're talking about research, for example, it could be said, um, that results were discovered, but who discovered them is not even part of the sentence. Um, so occasionally the subject is missing even, and it's helpful to look for that and try to put the subject back in. Um, if results were discovered, who discovered them? If results were shared, who shared them? Sentences with active voice can be more clear and active. If you have any questions about this, um, feel free, of course, to follow up. And stay specific. So if you're talking about a time that was hard for you, go into that a little bit. Indicate why it was hard or uh, in what way it was hard. If you say you're afraid about climate change, um, describe a moment that prompted that fear or what that fear felt like or what it made you do. Uh, Smells and flavors and emotions and conversations are all great ways to shed light on something you're trying to express. Um, in my piece about sobriety, I wanted to get across the point that people are more powerful when they work together. And at first, I just stated that as an opinion and something that I had realized. But the editors, in this case, Annie and Emily, asked, how did I come to that conclusion? How was that made evident to me? What was a really specific moment where I saw people working together and realized that that was a powerful thing for them to be doing? Or what did I witness that made me shift into this belief? Um, so these are things you can ask about really any claim or sentence throughout your story that you're writing. Uh, if you're describing an emotion, is there a way for you to show us how that manifested or what caused that emotion within you. Um, so again, just kind of a quick overview of a few helpful things to keep in mind as you're reviewing your pieces. And we will be there on the other side to circle a sentence and say, please make this more specific. Or to you know, note a sentence and say, this is in passive voice, but I think it might be better in active voice. Um, and so part of this process is you being open to feedback from us and we'll be open as well uh, to a street feedback from you or we want to preserve your voice as much as possible. And so you absolutely have the opportunity to come back and say, um, actually, you know, like the way I had that sentence is the way that I wanted and here's why. Um, it's a conversation. And so I'm just gonna leave you with this quote uh, and then we can talk about any questions if you have them.
the present political chaos is connected with the decay of language. One can probably bring about some improvement by starting at the verbal end. That was said by George Orwell in Politics of the English Language. And I can tell based on you being here and our discussions about reading and what's impacted us, that uh, you believe that language is powerful. You've been impacted by it and you believe that it can impact others. Um, so that's what we're here to do and to help you tell your stories. And as Annie said, um, before you start writing, you can absolutely reach out to us first to say, I actually, I don't know what the characters are here. I don't know how to flesh this out. Um, we're here to help. And so with all that said, that brings our formal workshop portion to a close, uh, but we do have some time for questions or comments. Um, so does anybody have any questions about what we just reviewed or discussed or anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Oh. If we already have something, can we send it to you for editing? Yeah, I would say um, that is going to be happening. Like people are sending us finished pieces. And in some cases, uh, you know, yeah. So we'll determine whether they fit or, you know, right. may have feedback in terms of how they could be made to fit the blog specifically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Seems like there's kind of a big overlap between this and the letter writing editor letter to the editor team. So uh, I don't know. I, I don't know why I asked that, but the same kind of the same process to go through. So and another question I had two questions. Uh, are you when you were talking about the genre, you're not thinking that everything on here would uh, fit into a certain genre, or are you? Uh, the genre of a blog post, is this blog post going to have its own sort of style? I think, um, well, genres are sort of living things, right? Um, and I think, you know, there, and, and also there are genres within genres, right? So um, I think like we said earlier in the in the workshop, um, you know, blogs oftentimes have subgenres like the interview or, um, you know, the hot take or what was the other one, the book review. Um, those are some subgenres that we've imagined. But uh, I think to the, I, I mean, you're right insofar as there's overlap between this and other kinds of, of public facing writing. Um, on the other hand, I think the discussion of genre is important because it helps us to um, identify, well, what's specific about this, right? Like what makes it different from writing an op-ed, for instance? Um, and I think that's actually really, really important to, to identify because it, it shifts the way you write and it shifts the way that you try to reach your, your audience. Um, so like for an op-ed, I mean, maybe we should just take the second to, to kind of think through that. Um, an op-ed, like what would, be, what would be the context of an op-ed? context like a wider public right like people right. might happen upon it and not necessarily be affiliated with 350 you might have like people i mean depending on the publication i guess right um you know you might have more of a chance of um having a reader encounter it who doesn't have or already have a kind of investment in climate justice work whereas i think with um the blog one of the you know one of the main differences is that you can count on, um, you know, given who our audience is, or our, our intended audience is, um, count on, on people already having that investment. So, you know, given that you'd be able to push them a little bit further and you wouldn't have to start with square one, right? Um, and, and, and because of that and so many other factors, so many other ways in which the, you know, the context, the audience, the purposes, the authors, um, the forum is different from other kinds of writing forums. Um, the styles of writing that emerge in that, which, you know, like, like you said, there's going to be multiple kinds of styles, but they're going to be different, right? Um, because they'll, they'll be designed to, you know, to succeed in that context. So, um, so I think, I mean, it's the whole point of genre analysis is really like 
to kind of like steal from other writers, right? Like it's like giving you, giving you permission to, to plagiarize, not content necessarily, but like stylistic choices that, that have emerged because they've worked really. Um, so I think it's just like a, some writing advice around like, look at, look at other blogs. And then like, as, as the understory accumulates more posts, I think you'll probably see a particular subgenre of, of blog post in the understory, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's the thing about genres is they, like even within a particular publication, like op-eds will be different in, um, you know, like in the New York Times from, you know, in the, in the Seattle Times, right? Um, Oh, I don't know. That's kind of a long-winded answer, but that's helpful. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Bobby. Also, even within letters to the editor, for example, in Scientific American or the New York Times, they'll be different from in, say, Orion or something like that. You know, is there just so when there's a different context and a, and a slightly different audience, you're gonna emphasize different things uh, and use a slightly different tone and so forth, you know, like the way that you talk to somebody in your family versus talk to one of your best friends or something, you know, uh, without thinking about it, we all sort of have a, a you know, a hundred plus genres within us for how we express ourselves. Um, and when we're doing it in writing, it's sometimes helpful just to be a little more explicit about, you know, that context. And, and Okay, I have another question. That is about the length. What kind of length are you looking for? I could look at the blog and see what they are. <laughs> I'm going to guess off the top of my head. I didn't do a word count, but I'm going to guess they're about a thousand words. Oh, is that sound about right? Huh. Oh, that's big. That's big. Okay. Is that big? I was going to say, oh, no, that's short. If you're used to letters to the editor, it's big because those are yeah. 215 or something. I think letters to the editor are much shorter than that. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are. Mm -hmm. um, it's much it's much more akin to an op-ed uh, okay. and, okay. and a longer op-ed and you know I I think most blog posts you know it's true are gonna be probably about a thousand words but if you look at a blog site like medium for example they'll be they'll be all over the map too so it really depends on the story you're telling uh, yeah. and and you know the longer it is the more you have to trust that it's gonna be really compelling to people you know mm -hmm. Um, if it's if it's short, it's easy to keep things kind of snappy, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And if, for instance, you have a, a super super long blog post, I mean, one you know one thing that we might do is say, oh, could this be a kind of series, right? Um, just knowing the kind of intention that people bring to reading a blog, which is kind of like short and sweet, and um, not sitting down to reading a, a full length article. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I have an observation, which is that I read a fair amount of bloggy stuff um, for my 350 Seattle work, and that for long posts, um, less, much less than half the time do I read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So if you want yourself to be read in its entirety, short is, is has something to be said for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, you know, Medium has that feature where they estimate, I think it's Medium that does that, or maybe also Eon, which is a publication I read, uh, where they estimate how long it's going to take you to read it. Uh, and if I see that something is a 20 or 25 minute read, even by like the people I admire most, sometimes I'll just like put it aside to be read some other time. And often as not, I don't get back to it, you know, unfortunately, uh, right. it's just sort of the reality of my days. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Well, thank you to everyone. Yeah. yeah. You did a Were very there... thoughtful job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Were there coming. any other questions? I saw someone went to unmute. Um... Oh, I just have one quick question. Um, will there be more workshops like this in the future where we can like bounce off ideas, kind of share like just very raw ideas and brainstorm? I like that. Um, we haven't talked about that, but I think that seems like a very valuable mm -hmm. idea. Um, more of like an actual workshopping style. So I don't know. Annie, Emily, what do you think? Um, I think it sounds like a cool idea. I wonder if it might not be better 
maybe we could create a list of folks who might be interested in workshopping things with each other. Because uh, mm -hmm. just knowing the amount of time that the two editors and I have, you know, it seems like it would be a long time before we could do that. Um, but, you know, if there are several writers who are interested in doing that, I, I can totally imagine us like trying to set people up. So, you know, and so maybe what we do, I think there's a way we can um, pull down exactly who took part in this meeting. We can certainly pull down who was interested in doing it, um, who signed up for it, and, uh, and then send an email out in the next few days and see if there's a folks, enough folks interested in that, that it makes sense, because I, I think it's a nice idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Thank maybe you. we could even create some kind of discussion forum where people could you know say like oh i'm thinking about this and other people could comment i don't know yeah but also you know amanda and i are always willing to um you know to be sounding boards to something in yeah. progress i just like to say i appreciate this chance to have this time with all of you and i really liked all of your blog posts mm -hmm different but uh, helpful. And Emily, I felt honored to be arrested with Imogene after <laughs> reading yours that I found out a lot about her that I didn't know because I just met her in jail. So, but we're <laughs> in that action. So thanks to all of you and Amanda for sharing what you're going through, what you're doing. So yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you me. all for showing up. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Good to see you Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. 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 bye.